people who are darker than blue. Don't let us hang around this town and let what others say come true. We're just good for nothing, they all figure. A grown-up, shiftless jigger. Now, we can't hardly go for that. Or is that really where it's at? Curtis Mayfield. African American Know Thyself, a question of identity, authored by my guest Ronald D. Steele, an 18 year student of African American history, currently a public affairs specialist with the federal government, also a freelance writer. Ronald says there is an answer to this insane behavioral pattern of the young male African American. It is as plain as the nose upon your face. Intrigued by the article, fascinated by its content and the manner of his simplicity, I invited him to appear on Communication Plus to talk about his opinions and the social problems that affect African Americans. I'm Vera Thompson. Good morning and welcome, Ronald Steele. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. There have been many suggested reasons for the behavioral patterns of young black males. How do you see the problem of today's youth? I see the problem as a um, situation where our youth have no sense of their self. They have no self-esteem. Self they have no context for which to judge current events or what's going on around them. For the most part, their parents have failed to teach them ancient history. They have failed to teach them recent history. And so most of these children have been raised basically uh, or, or based on what they have seen. And a lot of folks will tell you that what we see constitutes only 15% of our knowledge. 85% of our knowledge is derived from reading, traveling, and other forms. So if 15% of what they know is derived from what they see, then you have primarily television as a source of information. And television, as we all know, gives you a very distorted uh, sense of reality, including themselves. But it, television, are you suggesting that television uh, is the main link to what young black males are seeing and therefore they have uh, gotten into a behavior, as I alluded to, because of television or other uh, No, I don't think it's mistakes? because of television, although television is a primary influence. I think there are a lot of influences, but the primary reason why so many of our youth seem to be lost to crack and crime is because they have no sense of themselves. If their parents had taught them about the glorious history of their past, had taught them that they are the offspring of a people who founded civilization, um, if, they had, if their parents had taught them that, that the struggle for our freedom is still going on, if their parents had taught them recent history, such as the struggle of the, the recent civil rights movement, I think many of these children would, number one, realize that they are somebody, and they would realize that from within. Number two, they would also realize that the struggle still goes on, and that they have to be twice as good, that they have to try harder, and that there are numerous uh, pitfalls out there waiting to trap gullible, naive kids. They will also see drug dealing and the lure of, of uh, crime for what it actually is, a trap to enslave them. But, Ronald, you have a 30-year-old mother with a 15-year-old daughter or son. You have a 39-year-old grandmother with a with an 18-year-old daughter, and, a, and the daughter has a, uh, a baby. Uh, that grandmother that's 39, in all probability, might not know her own or, or her, her own history. How can you tell and how can you give what you don't necessarily have yourself? What do you, what do you, how, how, how can you make that connection to how great you are or could be to what is going on right now with the uneducated and children coming out of school with less than what they should have, and they're calling themselves high school graduates. I understand what you're saying. Uh, part of the reason why parents have not taught their children their history and their heritage and, and uh, developed their self-esteem from their vantage point is because it was never taught to them. 
but because it wasn't taught to them doesn't mean they can't learn. We're living in a period now where Africans, for the most part, are experiencing a wave of African centricity. There are a number of cultural events going on. There are uh, black history uh, events that goes on every year. Um, they're just, uh, I mean, compared to the way it was when we were kids, our society is almost inundated with African-centric oriented events and activities. There are books, there are films, there are tapes. So because these parents uh, were not taught their history and heritage, is no reason why they shouldn't attempt to learn. So it's, what you're saying is all around you. It's all around and us if now. You don't, if, and if you don't grasp it, it's simply that you're just closing your eyes to it, or, are you, or, or there's something wrong. That's right. And they have tried, I would imagine, a number of different ways to reach their children. Well, this is one way that they haven't tried. Okay, but let me let me say this. Being called and recognized as an African American is hard for some to swallow. You've got to agree to that, I'm, I'm sure. sure. What, in your opinion, can change the concept of Africans? What would change the concept, the concept of Africans? The concept of Africans and, and calling we, yourself an African and an African American. Because many okay. people just say, well, first you, I, I was a Negro, then I mm -hmm, was black, mm -hmm, and now, mm -hmm. I'm, now you want to say I'm African American. I, and, and, mm -hmm. I, I, don't wanna, I, I just want to be just like I am. I'm right here, and I, I want to be just where I was born in the United States. What do you say to people like that who, who actually know they're black, who know they're African Americans from descent, but... Of, but they don't want to own up to it. Identify with it. Identify. Well, there are two reasons for that. One of them is that the, the image of Africa has been distorted tremendously uh, in America. Uh, we grew up on Tarzan movies. Whenever references are made to Africa, it's usually made to the dark continent. It's made to the famine that is going on and the other problems that occur on the planet, which are, uh, in effect, a result of colonialization and not, you know, a natural outgrowth of the people. Um, also, the other reason why a lot of Africans, African Americans resist that description or definition is because they don't know very much about Africa. And it's hard for you to call yourself something that you know hardly anything about. And what you do know about it is very negative. So what I would tell those people is everybody in America came here from somewhere except for the Native American. And when those people come here, when the Chinese come to America, they are called Chinese Americans. When the Italians come to America, they are called Italian Americans. Russians come to America, they are called Russian Americans. We are from Africa. We are in America. We are African Americans. We are not Negro. We are not black. Everybody on the face of the globe have been named for a geographical location. Where is black? Where is Negro? In the dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it then, Ron? Uh, another question. The public school system has not to date portrayed Africans, African American, as producers of the African genius you've just spoken of. I'm glad you asked that question. And there are a few things that, that bother me more. I think that the school system is at the vanguard of perpetuating a slave mentality among our children. And the reason why they are that way is for the same reason that I just that I uh, explain why most African Americans don't want to uh, recognize that, that they are African Americans number one many of the people who control our school systems don't realize their African centricity they don't realize their history and their heritage themselves they have been taught the white way they have been taught the Eurocentric value system and for them to begin to start teaching their children, their students, their history and heritage means they have to go back to school. They have to relearn their own history and heritage and then teach it to their children. And a lot of teachers are just not pre prepared for that. A lot of faculty uh, members and, and administrators are just not prepared to throw out all the old textbooks which have only misled and perpetuate a slave mentality among our people and replace those books with books that would show that Africans were the first people to develop or to, de to uh, yes, to develop science, the first people to develop the arts, agriculture, architecture, ar astrology, uh, you name it. Africans were the first people to start those arts and sciences. And it's a shame. 
and it is also a betrayal of our own people. When you pull out a geography book and you and, and to teach your children, your students geography, and you're telling them about all of the contributions that Europeans and European Americans have contributed to develop to the development of that science, and don't teach them that the science was founded by Africans, people who look just like them. Integration. Was that a in, in the civil rights movement? How? What impact? Uh, many are saying now that maybe that wasn't such a good move. In your opinion, was it? Well, I'm a little ambiguous about what integration means as compared to desegregation. Desegregation, but with my own understanding, I am for desegregation, which meant, means simply that. It is illegal to exclude anybody from any public place because of race, creed, color, etc., and so forth. But integration was not necessarily the best thing for us, which meant that, in, in essence, that we had to be, uh, for example, in school system, there had to be a white student sitting beside us in order for us to excel. Um, I do not buy that line of integration. Integration hurt us in a lot of ways, simply because whereas before integration, African Americans relied on each other. They couldn't go in the mainstream, so they supported each other. They spent their money with African Americans. They went to African American schools. In D.C., Dunbar was one of the most outstanding schools in the nation. It was an African American school. There were m many more businesses, African-American businesses, that were thriving during segregation when we had to uh, uh, patronize each other than after uh, uh, segregation, when they brought about integration and almost un un op I mean, opened the doors to the mainstream. And, and, and now African-Americans, for the first time, had the opportunity to go to Garfinkel's to go t in the mainstream and to spend their dollars with Europeans and now they don't want to spend their money with African Americans. They don't want to support African American institutions. If it ain't white, as far as they're concerned, it's not quality. It's not right. And that's wrong. <laughs> you, you know, Ron, uh, it, it, while you were talking about that, I can remember um, doctors and lawyers, uh, what few there were, uh, and uh, the middle class blacks, all of them lived <clears throat> in the same block. You had that, that, that neighborhood. Now, if you become a doctor, now if you are a lawyer, now if you have a business, uh, you move away yes. from that block, and the block becomes with no quote unquote role models yes. so to speak so how are you going to bring all this back I mean you've got to turn the whole the whole system around as to what is middle class what is it that you need to give back and how to give it back well as a result of us entering the mainstream as a result of integration we took on a lot of values of European Americans and that class thing is one of them. The status thing is, is another one. I mean, we always appreciated status, but we weren't as, we, we didn't identify with the European symbols and value system as much as we do now. Um, how do you turn it around? Unfortunately, there is no shortcut answer. There is no overnight solution. The, even the solution that I recommend, which I think is the fundamental uh, solution, would probably take years to affect the whole masses of our people. And of course, in the interim, a lot of people will be lost. But what the reason why I say it's fundamental is that in order, we're talking about behavior change here. In order to change a person's behavior, you have to change what they know. I remember years ago uh, when they, there was this great discussion about uh, putting people who live in projects in brand new homes and assuming that because they had these brand new projects, that they would somehow or another become more sophisticated, more caring, etc., and so forth. Well, that that clearly demonstrated that changing a person's house Did does not, not change. change what's on the inside of that house. And in order for us to affect mass behavior change, we again we have to change what we know. We have to reclaim our natural history and heritage, and we'll begin 
to turn this whole thing around. My guest this morning is Ronald E. Steele, an 18-year student of African-American history, and uh, we're talking about African-American Know Thyself, authored by my guest, and what it is, we're going to get to that in this half, of how we can turn the behavioral patterns of young African-American males around. A few pages out of a book called Stolen Legacy gives a hint to Western civilization uh, social order. Point out the critical legacy not credited to African Americans. I'm sorry, I didn't understand your question. Uh, you, you, you say, I mean, well, I'm saying uh, Stolen Legacy, mm -hmm. a book by, I, I, I'm not sure of the author's name. But George G.M. Jones. Yes. Gives a hint to the to Western civilization uh, social order and how through Socrates mm -hmm. and uh, Aristotle these uh, the the social order of the Western civilization was taken mostly from African Americans or uh, the African. Yes, um, actually. Uh the gentleman, the author of the book, Stolen Legacy, which was published in 1954, was authored by Mr. George G.M. James. And that book in particular uh, illustrates how, ever since I can remember, and you may agree with this yourself, whenever the subject of philosophy is broached, we generally go back to, or we reference Aristotle, Plato and Socrates. Well, his book illustrates how it is impossible for them to have authored all of the treaties on philosophy that they are credited for, and that they were actually students in Egypt, and that most of the information that they, in fact, plagiarized was stolen from the uh, centers of learning in Egypt. So, um, his book only deals with one aspect of our stolen legacy, and that aspect is basically the, the, uh, the uh, uh, allegation that our Aristotle, Socrates, and Plato were great philosophers, when in fact they were great plagiarizers, and that the actual information uh, originated by Africans. You say also that African Americans were the fuel for the U.S. industrialism. Explain that. When Africans were brought to this country, let's bear in mind the fact that they found this civilization, all the arts and sciences, architecture, um, uh, writing, um, astrology, etc., and so forth. When these Africans were at Gunport, uprooted from their uh, native land and brought to America, all that technology was not lost to them. They brought that technology with them. And for the most part, all of the, I mean, I won't say all, but the majority of all of the inventions that were made in this country during the slavery period had to, logically, have been made by the Africans, the African slaves themselves, for two reasons. Number one, they were the workers. Number two, they brought technology with them when they came here, but they were owned by their slave masters. And whenever an African who had been working in the field all day trying to figure out a way to, 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 to uh, do things easier, do his work easier or more efficiently, came up with an invention, that slave master said, come here, boy. What you got there? Let me take a look at that. Don't you tell anybody you gave this to me. And the next thing you know, the slave master was filing a patent. You, 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 in your uh, material, there are a number of things that... Uh should or could be credited to African Americans. Do you have that handy? Yes, I do. Incidentally, um, the Anacostia Museum, which is located in Southeast, is exhibiting right now uh, a major display of African uh, American inventions, uh, many of which uh, was the bedrock of American uh, industri of America's industrial and, and agriculture economy. Some of those inventions include, um, for example, 
the shoe lancing machine, which increased shoe production from the manual one pair per week to thousands per week. You know, all the shoe, I, I don't want to cut you off, but okay. this just, you know, shoes aren't even made here anymore. They're, right. made, they're made in another country. That's right. Like Japan, ta Taiwan. That's right. And uh, I wonder what happened to that. Why is it we stopped using that right here in America? That, I, that's just a question. I, you know, I, I, go, go ahead. Why, why are we not using <laughs> yeah, it? Yeah, why well, are we not doing it now? Cheap labor. I mean, we can't afford to manufacture many things in America anymore because the cost of living as well as the cost of wages have gone up. Whereas in other developing nations, the cost of, of living as well as the cost of wages is very low. So American manufacturer being motivated, manufacturers being motivated by profit are going to take the manufacturing their products to these countries where the labor is cheap. So their profit margin is increased. And that's why you have a number of products being imported. But um, the, um, the shoe lasting machine is very, very important because a lot of Europeans were going barefooted or they didn't know the difference between a left shoe and a right shoe. And it was the inventor of this shoe lasting machine that taught them the difference and also taught them to manufacture thousands of shoes per week, which, of course, spurned that, that economy and that industry. There's also the real McCoy. Now, when I grew up, the real McCoy was this white guy who used to hop and came on television every week. Well, the real McCoy is named for Elijah McCoy, who invented the first self-lubricating machine. Now, when you think about that machine, that is an enormous, enormous invention. There would be no cars. There would be no, no long-running machines, period, if it were not for that invention. Or if it had come around, it would come around at a much later date. Before his invention, these machines, whatever they were, had to be stopped every so many hours to be lubricated. He invented the self-lubricating machine so that machines could run for hours upon hours, if not days, without having to be stopped and cooled. I'll try to run through the other uh, inventions without, you know, stopping and elaborating on each one of them. Um, Just the important ones. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, African Americans also invented the automatic railroad car coupler, which saved countless lives and injuries. Industrial food chemistry, which revolized, revolutionized the meat pack and industry. Mobile refrigeration, which brings us our good humor machines and and transporting uh, frozen foods from one city or state to the other. Um, uh, the carbon filament method for incandescent lamps. The traffic signal. Uh, you can imagine what a mess traffic would be without the invention of this traffic signal light. Or you would have to have police at every corner directing traffic. Um, an African American also invented the gas mask. The process for refining sugar. The blood plasma, of course, Dr. Charles R. Drew, which is a forerunner of blood blanks and the Red Cross. Uh, an African-American invented the portable x-ray machine, the incubator, the fountain pen. And, uh, and I guess you could go on and on. Yes, But yes. we're getting down on time. We're okay. getting down on time. And, and uh, uh, now, uh, having discussed all of that, let's get back to the regeneration of the self-image of behavior that you want to put into effect or you want other people to realize since you say it's as simple as the nose on your face. It really is. Um, what I recommend, as I had outlined in the book, I mean, in the article, again, is that we reclaim our history and our heritage and practice it and incorporate it in every aspect of our life. That is the first thing that we have to do. Um, we have to start supporting our, inst our institutions. We have to patronize our businesses. But uh, primarily... We have to reclaim our history and heritage. That begins at home. Just picking up a book, reading a book on our history and our heritage, discussing that book with our children, taking our children to the library to look up other books on the subject, films, uh, videotapes, uh, slide presentation, audio tapes, anything pertaining to our history. We should want it like a, a, a thirsty person wants water. And... Um, in addition to that, there are a number of cultural events that we could patronize. Uh, Ujima Shuli, a couple of weekends ago, had Family Day. Uh, these are uh, local, free uh, activities that African Americans can patronize, participate in, learn about their culture, and reinforce what they know about their culture, their history, and their heritage. Um, 
that's the rejuvenating rejuvenating process. Um, and it's and it's just that simple. We have to reclaim our natural history because knowing our natural history puts everything in in, in the proper context. It, it it helps enamel our self esteem. It gives us a purpose for 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 being. puts purpose in our life, and it puts us on the right course to destiny. You know, you mentioned uh, movies, and I think of one uh, that uh, do the right thing. Spike Lee, the most misunderstood African American filmmaker. African some African Americans are saying his latest film, Do the Right Thing, is trash. He didn't have the answer. Whites are saying it's riot inciting. How then do we get a chunk of a life presented in truth without controversy? And why was he expected to solve the question of identity, pride, and racism? Hmm. Well, um, the first question is, um, um, excuse me, you might repeat. Oh, okay, okay. Now, you, you know, say, many African Americans mm -hmm. are saying that the, the picture was trash. You say, it, why there's so much controversy? Yeah, why so much Whenever controversy? Whenever African Americans do something that is independent of European Americans, they are going to create the controversy, even if there is none. For example, white critics looked at that film and they saw the pizzeria be torched by a small group of people, and they called that a riot. Well, I lived in D.C. during 68, during the riot, and a riot was the whole community coming up against the establishment. That was not the case in that movie. A small group of people responding to a brother being killed by the police Another brother being killed by the police reacted, and they torched one store. That was not a riot. So that, that controversy has been contrived by the white critics. Now, um, why was he expected to answer the question of identity? Pride and racism. Well, I think he does address many of those subjects, and I think he does it eloquently. The only problem that I had with the movie is that in my estimation, what Spike Lee did was he showed us, that is the viewers, that racism affects all of us, that all of us have prejudices, and that those prejudices flaw each and every one of us. They render us relevant as human beings, but impotent in affecting our own interests. However, the only drawback with the film is that it did not include role models like yourself, Vera, myself, and others who are, in, in spite of prejudice, in spite of racism, are making it. But what about radio? Wasn't he somewhat of a role model within himself? Yes, he was, but you kind of saw so many of the flaws of, of prejudice in all of the other characters that the DJ, the radio man, his positiveness was almost overlooked. And he was such a jive talker that you kind of, you know, missed Grouped the point. Grouped him in with all the rest. Yes, and you kind of listened for his rhetoric rather than his substance. But people listening to this program this morning, what is it that you want them to come to go away with after it's over? Well, I hope if they forget everything else that I've said and remember only one thing, that is, please remember this, that our children who are identifying with the BMWs, the quick cash, the very, very expensive clothes, they are crying out for self-esteem. And the best way to change their behavior is to change what they know about themselves. And that is simply by reclaiming their natural history and heritage. My guest this morning has been Ronald D. Steele, an 18-year student of African-American history, sharing his views on how to change the insane behavioral pattern of some of our young black male Americans. Thank you, Ron, for joining me this morning. It's been very interesting. And as I told you, I, I, I'm, I, I'm just taken aback. Thank you very much for having me. This has been Communication Plus, and I'm Vera Thompson.